My name is Mehindi Kulasuri and Nancy Leia Dilhani Vikramasinghe. <laughs> that's not my address, that's not my life story, that's my actual name. And Dil comes from my first full name, Dilhani, which in my language means horny lesbian. Uh, <laughs> Just kidding, just kidding. No, it means, uh, it means uh, some, something about your heart, and you know, when you see her, your heart breaks, uh, some, some rubbish like that. Uh, but I much prefer my, my uh, meaning. Um, but of course, dil in Ireland, you know, in Sri Lanka, dil means heart, but in Ireland, it's reduced to a herb that accompanies salmon. You know, so, so, so listen, I can talk for hours about body image because um, my issues with body image started at the very early on. Uh, my mother uh, was a model for Vogue Italia. So, so she was very much into her looks, right? My father was a professional bodybuilder and he was Mr. Sri Lanka. So you couldn't get two more vain human beings. <laughs> Uh, you know, to, uh, as parents. So it was just, I mean, I can't tell you how important looks are for my family. And, and from a very early, on, early age, I realized that my self-worth was directly linked to how I looked. And of course, the, the whole, you know, I remember being, I think, 12 or 13 when I started waxing. Um, you know, I was wearing, you know, eyeshadow up to here. You know, I was, I was modeling myself, you know, because my, you know, I had to follow in my mother's uh, footsteps, you know. So it, I was very conscious about how I looked. And, and, and I do think that that played a big part in me becoming a, a, you know, a victim of sexual abuse because of a teacher uh, in my school, you know, a sexual predator you know, abused me for about two years. And, uh, and that was all, I think, very much connected to the fact that I was, you know, overly sexualized at age 12 or 13. And that was at the hands of my own parents, you know. So, um, and, and I think something happened in there, with, and I'm still, I suppose, trying to make sense of it through therapy, you know, about my femininity and the abuse, you know, all that is still kind of in the back of my head. But so, and, and then when I came out, my God, that was another story because, you know, when I became, when I came out to my parents, I didn't go well. My parents are Jehovah's Witnesses at that stage. They kicked me out of the family home. I was homeless for three years. But, but when, I, when I embraced my sexuality, I realized, okay, as a lesbian, what, do I, what am I supposed to look like? You know, because uh, this is the other message. Okay, a woman is supposed to look a certain way. Now a lesbian is supposed to look a certain way. And I will never forget the first time I went to a gay bar in London called, um, is it the Candy, Candy Bar, I think? Yeah, yeah thank you, thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think Alva may have been there a couple of times, <laughs> broken many hearts. Anyway, but I remember going into the candy bar and I was about 22 at that stage, or 23, and I, and I remember looking at, you know, oh gosh, you know, lesbians, uh, yeah, sh really short hair, you know, b tattoos, b uh, you know, facial piercings, and I, for some reason I thought uh, that's what a lesbian is supposed to look like, you know. But just to go back a little bit, uh, when I, le I left Sri Lanka, um, I actually started working as a flight attendant. Now, I had issues with the way I looked before I became a flight attendant. Tea, coffee, uh, your emergency exits and all the rest. But uh, when I joined Gulf Air, my body image issues went through the roof because image is everything when you're a flight attendant. In fact, I remember going for an interview, Cathay Pacific. Uh, the airline based in Hong Kong, and they were, they were recruiting in Sri Lanka. And it was a room like this in a hotel. There was about 400 women. All, we all came in for the selection process. And the first thing they did, even before talking to you, you ca they, they called your name, you came up to the top of the room, you stepped on a, on a, on a, on a scale, and if your height didn't match your weight, you were asked to leave. And I remember that day, as I said yesterday, and I, I, I failed the weight test. So I was asked to leave in front of 400 women. And then when I joined Gulf Air, uh, they, they, joined, they said, we'll hire you, but you are overweight. So you are going to be on the fat list. So every month, you have to go down to the grooming office and get weighed. And I can just see your mouths open. Because <laughs> you know, even now when I'm saying it, I can't believe that this is something. And, and look, I was desperate to get out of Sri Lanka because I knew that was the only way I would be able to survive and find my way to Europe and find a, a, a life where I could be myself and get away as far as possible from my Jehovah's Witness parents. So I was willing to do anything. But now I'm thinking, oh, God, I can't believe I went through all that. You know? so, so when I came to Ireland 15 years ago, I was finally, you know, 
you know, living in a society where I could be myself. And, and I, you know, really experimented, I suppose, and I pushed the boundaries of gender identity, and I you know, had really, really short hair, and, and, and I always got, when I went into the women's toilets, you know, sometimes security would be called because they thought there was a man in the women's toilets, you know? And I found myself having to go to accessible toilets because at least I'd go to, go to a toilet and I'd not be, you know, uh, harangued, like, you know? And, and I, I was, I, I applied for a job, um, and I was actually refused the job by, get this, a lesbian director because I was too butch. You know, so it's, it's really, really quite ridiculous when you think about it, all the different aspects of uh, body image issues and, and, and uh, that I've encountered over the years. So, so then, media. Now, I, I, my first love was to work in media, but when I applied for a job in Sri Lanka, I worked for about six months in, uh, in a national radio station, and I got fired when they found out I was gay. So I kind of shelved that idea. So, but when I came to Ireland, I still had that passion to get back into the media. But of course, when I, when I turned the telly on or when I put on the radio, there was absolutely no one who either sounds like me or, or looks like me because m most women, if not all women in Irish media, are extremely feminine. Uh, and, and I found, well, I don't look like them. Maybe I shouldn't apply for a job. But you know what? I did it anyway. And, and somehow I managed to get into uh, news talk. I still don't know how, how I did it, but I'm, I'm still there nearly eight years later. Um, but my show is on a Saturday night, you know, at 7 p.m. You know, th that is, that's a very clear message. You know, if you're, A, if you're a woman, uh, you really should be on the weekend. And if suddenly, if you look like the way you look, we're not gonna put you on prime time. And, and this is what I, I keep coming up against when I talk to people like, you know, uh, really, uh, Mira McCallaghan, Claire Byrne, all these wonderful journalists out there who are doing ph phenomenal work, they will tell you, no matter how talented you are as a journalist, is still very much about how you look. And, 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 and that's just not, not good enough, right? Uh, and then, as Alva said, recently I became a mom. And all this stuff about my body, you know, and, and that all kind of came to, a, to the forefront because suddenly you're going into the system, the maternity system, you know, when you're pregnant. And, and suddenly you start getting these messages that this body is actually not yours at all. It's, it's the consultant. It's the, it's the maternity services body. And they, should, they, they can do anything they want with it. And I, and I rebelled against it because I thought, hang on a second, this is my body, this is my baby. I don't feel comfortable giving birth in the maternity services because I, no one asked me for what my opinion, or when I gave my opinion, nobody listened to it. So I decided to have a home birth. Uh, and that's something, you know, Women, please think about it. If you if you're pregnant or you're going to get pregnant, you know, think about maybe going down the route of home birth because it really puts the power in in your hands and not in the hands of the maternity services. I breastfed Phoenix on on TV about four months ago, and the country had a meltdown. You know, <laughs> never mind the refugee crisis or the homeless problem in Ireland. No, Dilvi Krasinger breastfed her son on the TV. I mean, the the the. the comments that we got were horrific. And again, it boils down to the fact that, you know, this is my body and I want to do what I want to do with it, but, but everybody else has an issue with it, you know, including wanting to serve my son lunch. You know, it just happened to be on TV. I didn't do it, on, I didn't go on TV saying I'm going to breastfeed my son. It just happened two minutes before we went on air. He kicked up. I turned around to Elaine Crowley and she said, you got to do what you got to do. And we did it, you know, but again, people feel these, these are, you know, our breasts are mammary glands. And I, in the last six months, I've exclusively breastfed my son. And I, and I never even knew the joy of being able to do that. Because when I thought of breasts, I thought of them as society has, you know, a sexual element, not something that is part of your biology to actually nourish your own child. You know, so we really need to talk about that as well. And um, as, as young women here, you know, I've gone through, I don't know, how many years of psychotherapy. In fact, I set up a mental health support practice uh, because I know so much about the topic, you know, and I've gone, you know, years and years of, you know, deconstructing and dismantling all these negative messages that I got. You know, you guys have a real chance to, to, to you know, hopefully by hearing what, what, what we have gone through, maybe you don't have to make the same mistakes we did. Maybe you can just give the world around you the, excuse me, the proverbial finger and say, if you want, you know, I, this is me, Love it or hate it, you know, th th this is who I'm going to be, you know. But back to that negative messaging, just uh, to end, um, Phoenix is only six months, uh, seven months uh, th this week. We were at playgroup uh, last week, and another mother, you know, I just, I just realized, you know, sometimes moms can be judgmental about other babies and other moms and all that. And this was quite, 
quite uh, obvious. When she, she turned around, um, my son hates tummy time, this thing where you put your baby on the tummy and they have to lift their head up, and he hates it. But this other mom felt that she could say, oh, you know, uh, Phoenix, you're, to be a man, you have to be strong and you have to be brave. And Anne-Marie and myself just lost it. <laughs> we, we just had a meltdown in the, in the, in the play group. And I think a lot of it hadn't, had nothing to do with Phoenix. It had to do with, obviously, the p negative messaging that we have had to endure over, over our life. And we had this big, you know, discussion with this woman. It starts off that young, you know, so you know, I know Phoenix is going to be raised as a feminist, uh, you know, whether he likes it or not, right? <laughs> Uh, and God forbid, I have a feeling he's going to grow up to be a conservative, Catholic, banker. But, you know, I'll still love him, you know, but I think that's, that's the key. We, we, we have to stop uh, getting our children to wear, even at the toddler stage, this little t-shirt saying, I'm a little princess or I'm, I'm a strong little man, you know, because you know, gender stereotyping is just, it's not helping anyone. And uh, when it comes to, from, eat, from an eating disorder point of view, um, Harriet Preston, I was just talking to her uh, from BodyWise, they were saying that, you know, yes, women have eating disorders, but for the first time now in Ireland, they're seeing that boys are having just at the same issues. Before they were a small minority, but now it's almost 50-50. So it's, it's, it's rampant, and, we, and you, you can do something about it. We, 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 it's our responsibility to pave the way and talk to you and mentor you and, and give you as much support as possible, but it's in your hands, guys. And, and I have a lot of hope for Ireland because look at you, you're here, you know? So thank you very much.